This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Welcome to another episode of Cal's Corner Radio here on the X-Zone Broadcast Network. My name is Cal Korf, and I'm your host, and this show is produced by the one and only truly legendary, my honest opinion here, Rob McConnell. It's an honor to be part of the X-Zone family, which continues to grow, by the way. It's incredible. So uh, tonight we have a very special show. I'm going to give you a lot of details, folks. Feel free to check all of it. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I'm not wrong on any of this, but I always have a standing offer that if I do make a mistake, I'll be happy to correct it in the public record, whether it's in an article or on the air here. I don't have an ego in all of this. So what we're going to cover tonight is we're going to talk about the red-hot controversy over American President Donald Trump and the recent indictment against Paul Manafort and some other individuals by the former director of the FBI, who is now the special prosecutor, Robert Mueller III. I will give you chapter and verse on how the U.S. government, including the Obama administration, contrary to their lies uh, denying it, absolutely have spied on Donald Trump for years. In fact, it's been going on for decades, and there's actually a very logical reason for it, regardless of uh, whether Trump is innocent or not in whatever issue. So we'll get into all of that. Before we get into that for the rest of the show, after the commercial break here, I want to update a couple of things real quick because they're breaking stories. One is there has been a disaster apparently now being reported in the Japanese media in communist North Korea. The uh, communist Chinese government has warned North Korea not to detonate any more nuclear weapons, not because they really care whether – Uh, North Korea has them because they've actually been using North Korea and helping fund and uh, further the nuclear weapons program there so that one day they have uh, capable intercontinental ballistic missiles, which of course can strike the U.S., which is what China wants. China uses communist North Korea as a uh, ability to open up another front in a war against the West, specifically the U.S. and Japan. And, of course, it uses the country of Pakistan, which neighbors India, to pester India all the time. So the Chinese are not innocent. But what has China concerned is apparently what has happened now, and that is that there has been a collapse of two tunnels in that underground facility. They were working on one tunnel. It collapsed and apparently trapped 100 workers. Assuming they survived the caving in, they're dead from radiation exposure. Now, another tunnel was apparently dug to try to rescue them, and that also collapsed. So apparently at least 200 people have died, and according to the preliminary reports, this has yet to be confirmed by official analysis elsewhere, radioactivity is now leaking out of that facility, Chernobyl-style. You may remember that uh, disaster where a nuclear reactor essentially exploded in the Ukraine in Chernobyl. And radiation reached as far north as Sweden. It was actually uh, contaminated the pasture fields that cows grazed on, and cows consumed that grass, and radiation was detected in the milk that Swedes drink, and a lot of cattle had to be uh, killed to uh, contain the disaster. Now, if this is true, China had warned for weeks now that there was a danger of this happening that North Korea could not afford to detonate another nuclear explosion because the last one apparently was 100 kilotons in power, which was about 100 times more strong than their first nuclear test or the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, roughly. Now this radioactivity, if it is spewing forth, is hitting the southern border of China, and of course this is a disaster that will only increase. 
again, we're following this story and we'll do an update uh, as soon as possible, as soon as more confirmed information comes out. But that seems to be what has happened. Now, uh, another update real quick. There's another impending disaster in the, from the small country of Madagascar. There is a longtime tradition there where people actually dig up dead bodies of their ancestors and they dance with them, even in music. It, it's nuts to do that, but they do that. The problem is that many of these bodies have the Black Plague. Not surprisingly, dozens of people have come down with it now, and the fear is that one of these individuals will dance with one of his dead ancestors and then get on an airplane and head to Canada or the United States or someplace in the West and help spread the plague. So they are trying to crack down on people, tell them not to do it. it it's mind-blowing that in today's world where we know about viruses and we certainly know about the deadly history of the Black Plague, that people would dance with bodies that have it. But this is a real problem. It is uh, a crisis now in that country. And, of course, we'll give you any updates as that story breaks over the next week as well as whatever is going on in communist North Korea. Now, after the station break here shortly, we're going to get into the minute details of the long history of the U.S. government spying on Donald Trump and the Russians and Ukrainians and Kazakhstanis he has long associated with. I'll give you chapter and verse on all of it and point out many things in this expose and put together a bunch of facts that you pretty much won't see anywhere else. Uh, why no one else is covering these issues, I don't know. You'll have to ask those reporters. And of course, there's a lot of biased media reporting going on with agenda-driven stories where they're either pro-Trump or pro-Hillary. And lost in all of this polarization, unfortunately, are the basic facts and truth. And we're going to give you those here on this network exclusively because you won't find this detail anywhere else. And I'm saying this independent of the fact that I'm doing it. I'm telling you the truth. We'll be back after this break and we'll get into all this nice, wonderful stuff. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Welcome back to Segment 2 on Cal's Corner here on the X-Zone Broadcast Network. My name is Cal Korf, and I'm your host. Now, folks, this show is going to be jam-packed with a lot of information. Uh, you can either write it down, of course, uh, once you listen to it. You can double-check it. If you find any errors, please let me know. Uh, I'm again, have a standing offer to anybody that if I make a mistake, because I am human, I'm happy to correct them in the public record. I have no ego in this. So if you read an article I've written that's published in the papers, because I'm published at least usually twice a day, uh, or on this show, please let me know. I'm happy to correct the record. Now, to understand what has gone on lately, this is the indictment of Paul Manafort, who was briefly Donald Trump's campaign manager. He was fired after a few months uh, holding that job, but he did oversee the final stretch of 
Trump's uh, surprising victory over Hillary Clinton. When I say surprising, I mean it was surprising to a lot of people. It wasn't surprising to me. In fact, I'm one of the few journalists who covered the campaign and predicted a win by Donald Trump. Now, I'm not an expert on this stuff. I don't profess to be. There's plenty of people out there who are a lot more smarter than I will ever be on this subject. But even I could see with my limited understanding of these issues, such as they are, compared to people who study this stuff for a living, uh, I could see that Trump was probably going to win. And the reason I say that is because I was listening to what the American people were saying. They were not happy with the status quo. In fact, they don't actually like either party, but they certainly didn't like Hillary Clinton. She entered the race with the highest untrust worthy rating of all the candidates, and she left office essentially with that dubious distinction. So while Hillary Clinton has gone around, as we've exposed, lying about why she lost because she blames everybody but herself, the fact is she lost because she's Hillary Clinton. Now, Clinton uh, supporters don't want to hear that because they're not interested in facts. They're still upset over the fact that Donald Trump won, but had everybody who claims to be a Democrat or had supported Bernie Sanders bothered to vote in this election, Hillary would be in the White House now and Donald Trump would not be. So one of the reasons that Hillary lost is because nobody bothered to show up in sufficient numbers to give her the electoral college majority. Once you take out the uh, disproportionate influence voting-wise of California and uh, New York population wise and even then the voter turnout in New York was near a historic low is one of the lowest in the whole country you'll see that uh, Donald Trump pretty much swept most of the rest of the nation specifically he flipped the blue states as they're called or the blue firewall states that Hillary took for granted states like Wisconsin where she was so arrogant she didn't even bother campaigning in that state despite the fact she never won it. She didn't win it against a Barack Obama when she ran against him in 2008, and she didn't win it when she ran against uh, Bernie Sanders. She lost then, and she, of course, lost it to Donald Trump, blames voter suppression, which is a lie, and um, Hillary, again, is full of excuses because one consistent pattern with the Clintons is it's never their fault. It's always the fault of some vast conspiracy, and then they you know, make up names and things like that. So what does this have to do with Donald Trump? We'll come back to that in a moment, but let me give you some history here that explains why things are going on today, the way they are, and what has happened, because it's really a very straightforward issue. And I have to shake my head as a journalist who has covered this from the beginning, uh, especially last year during the campaign and the entire time this year. I also have a book that will be out sometime this year, which is titled In Russia's Orbit, why um, governments and Obama spied on Donald Trump and his associates. I wanted the book released uh, months ago, but I couldn't release it in all honesty because the appointment of Robert Mueller as special prosecutor had happened. And if I'd released the book there and then, people would rightly say, well, what about this development? What about that? And I couldn't address it ahead of time because my psychic powers never work. I can't predict what's going to happen because there's no such thing as psychic powers, although people claim they have them, and I certainly don't. So what I didn't want to do was release a book that was premature, and what I mean by that is it would not give you the latest info. Now, the core research of the book is finished, and what I'm going to share with you are highlights from it, so I can tell you I absolutely know this data stone cold. It's not a secret. Someone just has to bother connecting the dots. And unfortunately, most of the media who have covered this have not bothered to do it. In fact, I'm so disappointed in my fellow journalists that uh, don't get me started on that. So uh, I will release the book when enough of the new developments happens, meaning whether Manafort is convicted and goes to prison or whatever, any time in the future of this year uh, or early next where I can wrap it up neatly then I will release the book. Otherwise, it's pretty much ready to go. And the good news is none of the recent developments have torpedoed any of the research in the book, which means I got it essentially correct, and that always feels good from a journalistic and human standpoint. I certainly don't like to get things wrong, and neither does anyone else that I know of. So let's now go back in time a bit to understand the genesis of what has happened over the years and why we are where we are today. 
Now, you may remember that American President Donald Trump months ago had directly accused his predecessor, now this would be former President Barack Obama, of course, of, quote, wiretapping, unquote, him, Trump. Now, Trump's blunt and serious allegation conjures up a Nixon-like image of a sitting president, Obama in this case, ordering his minions to spy on a political rival, much like Richard Nixon did when he ordered his plumbers, such as former CIA operative E. Howard Hunt, to do his dirty and illegal work for him, which included burglaries. This is the famous Watergate break-in. Now, if reality were this simple, it would be great, but it isn't. In truth, Obama did not need to directly order anything where it concerned spying on Trump and his associates, nor anyone else in the world for all practical purposes. Now, this is because both the processes and mechanisms for doing such things, that is spying on people, doesn't matter who you are, they're largely automagic since years earlier, it was the Obama administration who put into place the formal methods, programs, and equipment to guarantee that it can spy on anyone with impunity, even in real time. And I'll get back to that in a moment. Now, understandably, Trump's allegation against Obama is, is serious. Trump is the president of the United States of America. He's now the most powerful man in the world. And he officially accused months ago the previous most powerful man on the planet of spying on him and essentially ordering that this be done. Trump used the words, and this is a quote, Obama had my wires tapped, and he put wires tapped in quotes. It was a figure of speech. It wasn't literally, although his critics think it was, of course, in Trump Tower just before the election victory. Now, Trump did not say that anybody else had done it. He singled out Obama. Now, in response to Trump's serious charges, Obama's spokesman, Kevin Lewis, issued an official statement, which predictably has been touted by pro-Obama elements as evidence, quote-unquote, that Trump is lying yet again. Now, Trump does, a, does have a track record, which is palpable, of playing fast and loose with the facts. He has a very long history of not telling the truth. You can Google that. Now, the statement issued by Kevin Lewis said, and this is a quote, a cardinal rule of the Obama administration was that no White House official ever interfered with any independent investigation led by the Department of Justice. As part of that practice, neither President Obama nor any White House official ever ordered surveillance of any U.S. citizen. Lewis then added uh, that any suggestion otherwise is simply false. Now, I will tell you, because I reported on it back in April in the newspapers, in the Daily Post, or uh, excuse me, Daily World newspaper, that there's a huge problem with Obama's statement. It is unquestionably a lie, and there's no other way to put it, folks. I'm being very blunt with you. I'm not going to uh, sugarcoat this. Obama's denial is, in fact, a cheap oratory trick which is called a non-response response. Now, to put this another way, there was no reason for Obama to directly order that Trump be put under surveillance since the mechanisms to do so, thanks to top-secret spying programs, guaranteed that this would happen without any direct orders required. Now, ironically, and not coincidentally, these Orwellian, as in George Orwell, capabilities were specifically put into place by Obama during his two terms as president. Now, to use an analogy to explain this, if a married couple goes out to dinner at a restaurant, it is not necessary for the husband to order what he wants to eat when his wife has already done so. Think about that for a moment. Now, the spying of Donald Trump and Trump Tower uh, on, and of Trump himself by the U.S. government is absolutely nothing new. In fact, it kicked into high gear in late 1998. That was a long time ago, it was last century, when Russia defaulted on its $40 billion debt. Now, during this economic crisis, the Russian mafia and various oligarchs 
moved billions of dollars out of Russia, and they invested lots of cash into real estate. Trump was one of the beneficiaries of this dynamic, as were other real estate moguls. So it's not fair and it's not accurate to single out Donald Trump. He's not the only one who benefited from this dynamic. Now, this is not to say that Trump broke any laws when he did this. On the other hand, one can argue that there were not a lot of questions asked as to where was the money coming from. Yet there is no question that his Trump Tower project, which began construction in October of 1998, that's the same year, absolutely, unquestionably profited from Russia's economic collapse. Now, in the case of Trump Tower, by 2004, a disproportionately large number of Russians, Ukrainians, and Kazakhstanis, these would be people from the country of Kazakhstan, which used to be part of the former Soviet Union or USSR, had purchased properties in Trump Tower after it opened in 2001. These three nationalities accounted for as much as a third of everything that was sold from the 74th to the 83rd floors of the Trump Tower building. Now, predictably, several of these owners were criminals. This does not mean that Trump knew this about all of them ahead of time, but the intelligence community and law enforcement certainly and absolutely did know this. Now, one such individual that Trump uh, got involved with, or at least was operating out of Trump Tower, that's a better way to put it, was a gentleman named Edward Nektalov. That's N-E-K-T-A-L-O-V. Google it. Look it up on the Internet. Check what I'm telling you. This individual laundered money by using diamonds and gold. He was in partnership with the Colombian Mafia. Now, fearing that he would cut a deal with the U.S. government and turn informant. Nektalov was murdered in the streets of New York. A hitman fired a bullet into the back of his head, then approached the body when it was on the floor, uh, on the ground, and pumped two more rounds into it at point-blank range. That's a typical execution tactic in Russia. In fact, you see that when in Russia... Journalists get killed and other opponents of uh, Vladimir Putin, they're often shot at close range. Now, around mid-2005, American Paul Manafort would become Trump's campaign manager. We'll talk about that and pick this up after the commercial break. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Welcome back to segment three of Cal's Corner here on the X-Zone Broadcast Network. My name is Cal Korf, and I'm your host. Now, as I was saying, and I need to be very clear about this, Around mid-2005, uh, American Paul Manafort, you now this is the, the Manafort who would later become Donald Trump's campaign manager. And again, he masterminded the final stretch of the election that won Trump the White House. He and uh, Bannon were key uh, advisors and, and players in this. Without them, Trump may not have won. Well, years earlier, Manafort was hired by the Ukrainian oligarch Renat Akhmatov to put Russian President Vladimir Putin's sock puppet Viktor Yanukovych into power as the president of Ukraine. Now, Yanukovych won Ukraine's election eventually and became that country's president. Now, Manafort's activities were reported by the Department of State and they noted in a secret cable in 2006, I've got a copy of it, that 
he was overhauling uh, Yanukovych's public image. And according to handwritten ledgers, which have been shown by the media that were found in his residence after the coup ousted him, this would be the former president of Ukraine, Manafort may have been paid as much as $12 million for his efforts. Now, we must remember that Yanukovych was overthrown in early 2014, just a few years ago, by a popular uprising after he pulled out of a deal that he had made uh, to move Ukraine towards the European Union. In other words, most Ukrainians which is why they rose up against him when they found out this wasn't going to happen. They don't want to be a puppet of Russia. They don't want to be in Russia's orbit. They want to join the West, join the European Union, and become part of NATO. And this is what bothers Vladimir Putin. Putin has constantly complained that the fall of the former Soviet Union, the USSR, was the greatest calamity to ever hit Russia. Now, historically, that claim is a little bogus because one could argue that Adolf Hitler's invasion of the former Soviet Union was a worse event. But that's what Putin says, and he has a right to his opinion. doesn't necessarily automatically mean it is historically factual. But obviously, Russia had to downsize. And for years, it was at the mercy, essentially, of the West. And Putin is correct that during the ensuing years, the countries that were ruled over by Russia – suppressed and oppressed under communism. This would be countries like the former Czechoslovakia, now known as the Czech Republic, or Chechia, not Chechnya, but Chechia, which is what Czechs like to call their country now. What used to be, uh, what is now Slovakia, what used to, what is Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, they all joined the EU and NATO. And the reason they did it, and I remember living in Prague uh, for 10 years, and they... Uh, it was an open secret there that the main reason the Czechs did it was to keep Russia from controlling them again. It's not that they wanted to join either Russia or the U.S. or NATO, but because, as it was explained to me many times, and I asked about this a lot, they're a small country of 10 million people. So they need help. They need protection from bigger, more powerful countries, and the USA was the only other game in town to protect itself from Russia. And since most of Europe now belongs to NATO and the European Union, uh, this bothers Putin because when a country joins NATO, it agrees to an all-or-nothing set of conditions, and of course, weapons will be put in that country and a military beefed up to be compliant with NATO standards. And as Putin has said, this gave you the excuse to put weapons right up to our borders. Now, Putin doesn't want Ukraine to be independent because it would mean NATO and the EU would shift right next to Russia. And there is an important industry that Russia depends on that is vital still to this day that the Ukraine supplies Russia. The Ukraine at one time had the third largest collection of nuclear weapons on the planet. They gave up all their nuclear weapons in exchange for a so-called security agreement or promise from the United States, from Great Britain, from China, of all countries, that if they were ever invaded or, or tried to be conquered by Russia, that these countries would come to the Ukraine's defense. Well, as we saw when Putin seized the, uh, the uh, Crimea illegally, according to international laws, uh, nobody lifted a finger. And to expect Obama to do it is a joke. So the Ukraine has been left hung out to dry. What Putin gets out of Ukraine is a key uh, industry. Ukraine makes many of the rocket engines that Russia uses to make its intercontinental ballistic missiles that contain nuclear weapons. Because while Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons and they had the most advanced ones that the Russians had stationed there of all kinds, um, the expertise remained there. And Russia is still dependent on it. So if Ukraine joins the West, all of a sudden Russia doesn't have the immediate ability to go ahead and continue to make their uh, peace-threatening missiles that are very deadly. In fact, the most powerful Russian nuclear missile can literally destroy the state of Texas, one uh, uh, rocket, as well as an, a country the size of France. That's how powerful they are. They're much more powerful than American nuclear weapons, but they're not as accurate. But when your explosive power is that big, 
it doesn't really matter how accurate you are because you're taking out such a wide radius of uh, targets. So what happened is that uh, when he, when Yanukovych was overthrown in early 2014 by the popular uprising, what he had done is he had told the Ukrainian people that he changed his mind and under pressure from Putin, he took a $12.5 billion loan in exchange for dropping any plans to join the EU and to join NATO. Now that upset most Ukrainians and after the police there had uh, killed some innocent protesters that steeled the resolve of the Ukrainian people admirably to rise up and overthrow him. And he, of course, left and fled like a coward to Russia. Now, when this was going on, USA and European intelligence agencies naturally monitored everything. That's their job. Now, this is not surprising, again, because it is their job. And if they didn't do it, uh, it would be a disaster. Now, how they did this was they were spying on all electronic forms of communications. This includes faxes, emails, the Internet, and yes, even social media, mobile phone calls, etc. Now, there are two top secret programs that were involved in this the first was known as Bull Run, that's its code name, and it's run by the National Security Agency. And it has a counterpart in Great Britain known as Edge Hill. They, these two programs, especially Edge Hill, are responsible for breaking encryption schemes. So you might use programs like Skype or whatever, but the NSA and the British and other intelligence agencies have long ago learned how to break those encryption schemes. So they're basically useless. The idea that you have real privacy in this world is a delusion. Now how the British and the Americans spy on communications worldwide and then they go to various uh, different entities and uh, analysts within the intelligence communities, they do this through a top secret program called Operation Tempora. And what Tempora does is it monitors global communications traffic that is transmitted via underground cables located on the floor of the Atlantic Ocean. Now, this technique is so simple that it's been used for decades. When Ronald Reagan was president of the United States, the NSA had a secret operation, one code name of which was called Baby Bells. And what they did is they put these um, sniffers on the outside of Russian communications cables that went along the coast of the territory of the former USSR. And for many, many months, the NSA could actually hear all of the communications that were going on between especially the Russian Navy and the Russian military high command in the Kremlin. And it was only through a Russian spy that uh, had penetrated the uh, U.S. government, that that program was uh, betrayed to the Soviets, and then, of course, uh, it had to be uh, canceled. So the idea that you put something on a pipeline of data to listen to it and, and scoop up the traffic, that's nothing new. It's an old method. It's been used for many, many years. And this Operation Tempora does it because the communication cables go under the Atlantic Ocean. And not surprisingly, they emerge from the Atlantic Ocean in Great Britain. And the cables are located on a facility that is owned by the British government. And, of course, it's immune from any private lawsuits or any attempts to prosecute for violating privacy laws. The British then go ahead and decipher and monitor that data, and then they share it with the NSA. There's what is called the Five Eyes Agreement, which is an agreement that goes back that was signed by President Harry Truman in the late 1940s. It used to be the Four Eyes Agreement, but Israel was added to that agreement later. And what it basically means is we don't bother spying on a lot of the stuff. The U.S. doesn't because Canada will handle certain parts of it. And, of course, Great Britain will. And then these countries share data, and therefore uh, that's how the intelligence is uh, passed around and known to other entities. So if an analyst in Britain 
says, well, this might be of interest to the Americans. It involves some Americans. They automatically route it to the USA for further processing, and then Great Britain's involvement is usually done at that point, and the U.S. reciprocates with its allies and does it. So when Manafort later became Trump's campaign manager, the eavesdropping on him, which had been going on for years when he started being a paid puppet of the Ukraine government and essentially doing Putin's bidding, it continued, especially after it was learned that Russian intelligence had successfully fished Hillary Clinton's campaign manager's email account, this would be John Podesta, and through a third party gave this information to WikiLeaks, who, as we all know, published these uh, uh, emails. Now, I have to correct the record here uh, of the media because it's inexcusable where it concerns this issue. Um, the term is used that Hillary Clinton's email or uh, her campaign manager, John Podesta, that his emails were hacked. That is not true. It is not true technically. It is not true factually. There was no hacking there. It wasn't necessary. Instead, what happened was rather stupid but very common, and almost everybody listening to this who surfs the internet or uses email, they get this trick attempted on them all the time. And let me explain how it works. It's called phishing, and it's spelled P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, not to be confused with the other word phishing, F-I-S-H-I-N-G, which of course is something very different. So what happened is Hillary Clinton's campaign manager, Podesta, he got an email that appeared to be from a legitimate source, Google, saying that the password had to be changed because Google had been hacked. So the IT person uh, was asked if this was a legitimate email. He claims he sent an SMS saying it wasn't legit, but autocorrect uh, ended up changing that word and said it was correct. We have no idea if that story is true. It cannot be independently verified. And what happened is because they entered the new password and did change it, that information went straight to Russian hackers. There was no need to hack anything because the Podesta campaign voluntarily gave up that information. So word to the wise, if you get an email that says, this is Yahoo, whatever, you have to change your password now, we're going to close your account, it is most likely going to be a fraudulent email that if you enter your new password uh, to, quote, update your file, unquote, then you're giving hackers that information, and then, of course, you're going to become a victim. So that is what happened with the Podesta campaign. They were not hacked. They were fished. Shame on the media for not telling the truth. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Welcome back to the final segment here on Cal's Corner Radio Show. My name is Cal Korf, and I'm your host. The executive producer of the show is, of course, Rob McConnell. Boy, an hour goes by fast. It's so hard to talk about some of these detailed issues, uh, important issues in an hour, but we try to do our best. So to wrap up the issue of Manafort, when Manafort became Trump's campaign manager, 
uh, again, the eavesdropping continued. And to believe that the Obama administration and nobody else spied on Trump is to believe that at least 700 to 1,000 intelligence and law enforcement officials were not doing their jobs for years, and that just is not credible. That State Department memo would not exist, for example, and be in the public record if there was no spying or reporting going on. Now, uh, so Manafort has had a long history of being spied on. So if you're Paul Manafort and you're being spied on, all of a sudden you start talking to the Pope, the Pope gets spied on as a natural consequence of that dynamic. So the idea that Trump was being spied on is quite logical, but it actually goes back many years earlier, okay? For example, there is a man, and you can Google him. His name is Felix, F-E-L-I-X. His last name is Sater, S-A-T-E-R. And as I have constantly said in my reporting on this, because it is true, and this occurred late last year and, of course, uh, several times this year. It's a matter of public record, these articles. Felix Sater and Paul Manafort are the key to understanding what is going on now. And they've always been the key to understanding what has been going on with Donald Trump. Now, what happened is Felix Sater was a partner with Donald Trump in a real estate venture that went south, Okay. Uh, Sater was one of the key driving forces behind another one of Donald Trump's uh, real estate development projects called Trump Soho Tower. All right. And what happened is that the um, this uh, project ended up having a money laundering problem. And what happened is that the property and the number of units that were being sold was being deliberately misrepresented to potential investors. And what happened is that a lawsuit was filed essentially for fraud and it was eventually settled. Uh, what happened is the uh, uh, money was paid to settle it, make it go away. And where this gets interesting is that Donald Trump essentially denied that he knew Sater or said that he only knew him peripherally and really wouldn't recognize him if uh, they were in the same room. Yet there are photographs of Trump with Sater, which totally destroys his claim. It is not credible. So uh, this happened uh, many years ago, all right? And what happened as well is that uh, money laundering was occurring, and the U.S. government, under the FBI, and this involved the uh, then uh, FBI Director Robert Mueller and some of the other, uh, of course, attorney generals over the years, they went after Sater, and Sater was afraid of going to jail so uh, enormously that he volunteered to turn into a spy for the U.S. government. And what Sater did, as he admits, he openly talks about it, is he went ahead and uh, cut a deal with the U.S. government. And none other than Attorney General Loretta Lynch, who was involved in his case, now this would be during the time of FBI Director uh, James Comey by this time, because it took years to wade through this. What happened is that Sater had connections with the Russian mafia and the oligarchs and the Putin government. And basically, his nickname was Mr. Contact. I know everybody. And what he did is he did a couple of extremely important favors for the U.S. government. And I'll summarize what a few of them are. Because what happened earlier this year, and it was not as re widely reported by the pro-Hillary Clinton press, which is shame on them, is that um, there was a hearing that was held where his records – of what he had done for the U.S. government were going to be leaked to the public as a matter of law and legal process. And what happened is Loretta Lynch was informed of this, that if she didn't file papers to show the court that this information should stay remain classified, that this information would come out. Well, she finally got off her you-know-what and filed the papers, and she testified that uh, Sater had performed invaluable services for the U.S. government. So most of Sater's records remain sealed 
under federal court order. That hasn't stopped Sater from talking, and he's been talking to a lot of people. Now, he has been asked repeatedly, was there collusion between Russia and the Trump campaign? Did these two guys get together and say, hey, help me get elected to the White House? He says absolutely not. And you have to defer to his testimony at this point because he's been credible on many, many other things. And, of course, he would know about it if it did happen. In fact, he basically has the opinion that you give Trump a little too much credit there. Now, I'm predicting ahead of time in public here on this show that by the time this, these investigations run their course, these would be the investigations being done by the government as well as Robert Mueller, that they will stop short of proving collusion because I don't think there was any. It wasn't necessary. This does not mean that the people who were around Trump were not trying to work various issues. We know that Mike Flynn was. We know that Sater was. We know that, uh, of course, Manafort was. In fact, it was Sater who gave to Flynn a so-called peace proposal that he was being pushed by Putin's government to settle the issue of Ukraine. And the short version of that is that parts of Ukraine would essentially be Russian or uh, kind of this murky autonomous state. And then what is the country of Ukraine now would be a lot smaller and this was the way to deal with it. And it was, of course, rejected by not only the Obama administration, but, of course, Donald Trump's people. Now, Flynn, of course, is uh, going to – is involved in this controversy. He is absolutely caught up in conflicts with Russia. And he, of course, has pushed Russian interests. What's going to happen with him eventually will be determined, of course, over time. Same with Manafort. But the fact is Sater has absolutely been involved. Now, what Sater has done for the U.S. government, and this is why he has never spent a single day in jail, remains free to this day. And one can argue that this is pure hypocrisy on the part of Mueller and the U.S. government, the Obama administration, and other key officials going back many years, is that he kept Stinger-type missiles out of the hands of al-Qaeda and the Taliban. In exchange for that, the U.S. government has let him off the hook. And Loretta Lynch outright lied when she said that she had no idea that the victims of the scam and the real estate deal he was running were not being compensated or refunded their money. She said that's not allowed by law. No, it's not. But it still hasn't happened, and it's not going to happen. So – out of one side of the U.S. government's mouth, it says if you launder money, you're going to go to jail. But if you can keep Stinger missiles from ending up in the hands of terrorists, we'll forgive you. You're a good guy. We love you. In fact, Sater did another favor for the U.S. government. He went into cities in Russia that are closed cities, that are secret cities, that officially do not appear on any Kremlin maps or any maps of Russia that are available in the public. And I've been to some of these uh, – unofficial cities before in Poland that used to not be on the maps uh, during the Cold War years. They exist. They're fascinating cities, but they're closed cities. They were secret. And what he did is he went in there and he was spying and he was reporting to the U.S. government on what he saw. And yet he walks around a free man today, unquestionably as a criminal, and he even talks about it. He doesn't hide it because he basically has immunity. Now, it's amazing that uh, Putin's guys or somebody in this whole mix here hasn't bumped him off yet. I don't wish anybody to have that happen to them, but this is a fact. So look up Sater. You'll find a whole bunch of info about him. So Sater and Monafort are the keys to understanding and unraveling what has gone on with Donald Trump over the years. The fact is that out of some of the properties that Donald Trump has sold to these foreign investors, specifically Kazakhstanis, who help launder money through the state-owned bank there, and the Russians and the Ukrainians. Ukraine has always been a playground for Russia's interests, and it will remain so until it's truly free and independent and part of the West one day, hopefully. There has been a lot of activity that has gone on. These criminals have been under the surveillance of the U.S. government, and Trump has been caught up in that uh, web of spying. 
and because other governments, including Polish intelligence, German intelligence, Lithuanian and Latvian intelligence, have all reported on Manafort and what Trump was doing, that information has always ended up in the government's hands. And, of course, we now know that it was uh, Loretta Lynch and Susan Rice who went ahead and uh, obtained data about Trump, despite their initial denials of it, which were not true. And, of course, they got the data unscrubbed so that Trump was identified either by name or in such detail that it was obvious they were talking about Donald Trump. So when Barack Obama said that he didn't order any spying, that was a non-response response. He didn't have to because the data was already flowing in. And what Obama achieved during his administration was he erected a super secret new facility in Utah that is a data collection and co uh, collating point for the NSA. It, the data comes into this one central thing from all inputs around the world. Analysts look at it, then they route it to specific departments around the world to go ahead and further process it. So I'm not surprised by any of this that is going on. I've always said these two individuals are the key to understanding what has gone on. But by the time this is all over, it's not going to prove collusion. It's simply going to prove that the U.S. government picks and chooses who it wants to prosecute and who it doesn't. And if you do enough favors for it, it doesn't matter how many people you uh, screw over in investing, and it doesn't matter how much money you launder. <laughs>